Let me put a file here. And we are live. It's showtime. Okay, good morning, afternoon, good night. Uh, this is the second talk of the day. It is a pleasure to be here and to introduce you to Rafael Azizi and Gilad Nier. Rafael's talk is titled Uses of Art, an invitation from Cavell. Uh, Rafael is an uh, associate professor of philosophy at the Federal University of Bahia in Brazil. His areas of interest are aesthetics, language, metaphilosophy. In his current research, he examines a number of contemporary philosophical articulations of the uses of art in the life world between radical autonomism and reductive in instrumentalism. And Gilad Nier will be the respondent. He's a postdoctoral post assistant at the University of Vienna. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2017. His work focuses on the philosophical methods of Wittgenstein and Heidegger, on the various shapes of human reasoning, and on the notion of intellectual transformation. Uh, so, Rafael, please go ahead. You have the floor, and then Gilad. Thank you again for being here, and have a great discussion. I'll be back soon. Ah, Richard is here too. Hi, Richard. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Jonathan Stecchio, Andrea Cachel, and all the other involved in this in the organization of this beautiful seminar. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Whatever here means, <laughs> but whatever it is, uh, uh, the gentle atmosphere you create makes it a good place to be. And apologies for not having been able to follow the previous discussion. Uh, I'm eager to watch them later. Thankfully, they are recorded. Uh, and thanks, uh, Gilad Nier, for accepting to, to respond. Uh, before I begin, let me say that Cavell's philosophy is increasingly, to me, a sort of beacon pointing in the direction of uh, work to be done. Uh, and especially uh, of the spirits in which it can be done, which involves crucially the experience of personhood in the life world. Uh, but I should say from the onset that I consider myself uh, an immigrant in Kabilian studies, an undocumented immigrant at that. I will apply for a, a, a green card at some point in the future though. Uh, and I'm saying this because uh, I think it explains the character of the text I sent to, uh, which is a bit loose, perhaps. Uh, uh, the, the talk I'll be giving is really uh, a program of study in a perspective from Cavell uh, over a certain scenario of contemporary aesthetics. It is also <clears throat> an attempt on my part to begin practicing the essay forum in which I'm also an immigrant. So immigrancy being, by the way, a beautiful Cavillian theme, isn't it? Modernity is one of those umbrella terms whose limits can be fuzzy. But it is perhaps safe to say that what most of us call modernity involves a critical stance whereby traditional seats of authority are subjected to rational and empirical public inquiry. This is a claim to a critical stance in the ordinary experience of persons in the life world. And, and it has perhaps many aspects. <clears throat> Let me point out uh, some of these aspects. An increasingly Republican governance mediated by collegiate bodies of deliberation the establishment of outlets for social experiments and democratic dissent controlled by a negative freedom, i.e. denying the proposition of ending all, all, all other experiments and dissents. The social construction of science based on evidence, 
the protection of subjective development in the world and access to speech in the public sphere. I could go on. So art and aesthetic experience might be seen in the same light as another aspect of this modern critical stance. I take it. <clears throat> One way of outlining or articulating images of art and aesthetic experience as aspects of this modern critical stance is, strangely enough, through the continuing impact of Plato's seminal gesture in aesthetics, even if indirectly. I don't mean the expulsion of the poets. Whatever else we can say about his conclusions, Plato recognized the power that art has of articulating meaning and value in ways that affect people more vividly than other pedagogic or overall communicative tools he saw operating around him. And perhaps with a wider range of affordances. Art does this typically by trying to limit, by trying to harness, by trying to control the experience of meaning yielded by that power. So echoes of Plato's insight can be heard in contemporary philosophies that reopen the question of the uses of art. Why I say reopen, uh, I hope we become a little bit clearer later. As Brazilian life in particular and Western life in general finds itself at a crossroads between a past of structural depression and visions of expansions of democratic liberties, we are called once again, I think, to protect and promote places in public life for spiritual, artistic, narrative, fictional work, works that freely experiment on both subjective and social life, not aiming at disruption as an intrinsic value, but to secure a space for human beings to engage with the pendular existential experience of both acknowledging others and avoiding the common. Let the qualifier, the qualifier public in public life, as I use this expression uh, above, let, let this qualifier public retain a threefold aspect here. The first pertaining to a shared experience between the realm of family and other more intimate prejudices, like churches, as Kant thought public education should ensure the second pertaining to the realm of objectivity in contrast to, to a metaphysics of privacy against which Wittgenstein unforgettably warned us. And the third aspect of public in public life uh, pertaining to the conditions of articulating and voicing one's mind in wider circles of conversation, which involves being freed from survival strictures as Hannah Arendt urges to be able to afford and secure. So I take Cavell's philosophy to be one such calling, one of the most powerful and far-reaching in recent decades, in terms of the ability to avoid philosophical reductionism in all areas to which he lent his impressive array of attention, and in terms of its capacity to court us back to addressing our human lives philosophically with one of the best tools of the trades, the essay form, instead of always, always or exclusively trying to emulate the scientific paper. What I'm going to do here is to canvas a frame of reference for a philosophical work in the spirit of that calling or invitation. That's the work of reading and hearing, finding voice and reaching out to others, which Cavell took as more urgent to philosophy than the systematic carving out of fully developed arguments, heavily bent on anticipating attacks in the game of philosophical dispute. So let me go over this frame of reference in just a couple of very wide strokes, 
and then uh, try to develop some of its different elements a bit further. Okay. So here are the white structs. <laughs> if we are to escape reification, i.e. a sort of cognitive neutrality of basic gnostic apprehension of the world, plus a fundamental disrespect of the other as free agents, we should recognize our mode of existence as always already one of existential engagements, what Wittgenstein came to call praxis in the 1940s, not entirely, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, unlike Heidegger's notion of care. One way of reconnecting with this, let's call it the proper human stance, is through a kind of debureaucratization or deautomatization of perception, disrupting our habits of sensibility so they open themselves up to new engagements. I think that this task can be generalized as that which is more congenial to arts in general, not only in more experimentally led works and genres, but also in more conventional art forms also. Why? Because arts, either experimental or more stable formally, is always an artificial framing of experience. Be it minimalists, think of Raymond Carver or Erich Hormer, or maximalists, think of Shakespeare or Balzac. A condition of possibility for the engagement with the artistic processes in this vein could be articulated with a Kajilian vocabulary in terms of the truth of skepticism, one of the main uh, themes of uh, this seminar, whose operation involves a more receptive attitude towards the invitation to debureaucratize perception, and thus favoring a more pluralistic view of praxis in general, and at the same time, a clearer view of more localized and stable commitments to meaning. Now, should we call this Cavell's humanism? If so, there would be echoes of Simone de Beauvoir's rejection of what she calls inhuman objectivities. Promises of godliness, adherence to microphysical and all-encompassing moral and political causes, etc. The compelling character of inhuman objectivities stem from a resistance to accept our original lack of being, Heideggerian theme, when the subject compromises his or her projects for which she no longer feels responsible in a world, after all, without assurances of meaningfulness. So the ongoing task of inhabiting, inhabiting the pendular human space of acknowledgments and avoidances is replaced with, a fant with fantasies of total adherence to inhuman objectivities. I must point out that uh, to say this in March of 2021 in Brazil is not a gesture one makes lightly. So those are the, the, the white strokes I mentioned above. Cavell teaches us again and again that in order to grasp the full import of a philosophical problem in its relevance to our lives, we must recognize the fine grains of its, of its context of availability to us. In order to conceive of art as fulfilling the task I just outlined in, in wide and brief strokes, I have to mark out, I feel I have to mark out a middle way between two philosophical excesses in aesthetics as this middle way is hinted at by some contemporary thinkers. What are this, these two excesses and what the, does this middle way consist in? Artistic processes of production and reception are artificial framings of ordinary experience that depend for their successful fruition on an attitude of existential engagement. 
the sensitivity to, to these attitudes or this aspect of experience is a common thread binding think, thinkers like Benjamin, Beauvoir, Gadamer, Adorno, Cavell, and others, and not just the notion of practice. We can outline this common thread as cutting through between the two theoretical excesses framing negatively as poles or limits, almost like tautology and contradiction, a useful reading exercise of those authors together, so radical autonomism and reductive instrumentalism. If a philosophical vision is to offer itself to us in which the best promises of artistic processes as artificial framings of experience are to be laid out clearly, the notion of uses of art should look for a balance or find a way between or avoid both radical autonomism and reductive instrumentalism. So radical autonomism is perhaps art's most common modern stance in philosophical imagination. We can look at this stance as dissolving art's power in a form of inconsequential self-containment. I mean, very roughly, art for art's sake. Reductive instrumentalism also dissolves art's powers for the philosophical imagination uh, seduced by it anyway by restricting art's experimental leeways, be it for religious, for political, or otherwise doctrinal or instrumental motivations, including controlled therapeutic uses of art, or even by framing those powers as assets for social climbing. Remember uh, Pierre Bourdieu's sociology of taste as distinction. So reductive instrumentalism also haunted and curbed art's freedom to devise experiments in novel visions for society and for processes of subjectivization. I think these two poles frame a theoretical tension by means of which some of the still most urgent bodies of work in contemporary aesthetics can be read. Stemming from Wittgenstein and Austin, Cavell's ordinary language philosophy, and specifically his philosophical, essayistic, and autobiographical approach of artistic processes, offers useful operating concepts and articulates a powerful, richly detailed invitation to such a reading, which is also an invitation to an existential engagement with artworks in a certain spirit of modernity I mentioned above. So let me canvas some of the elements implied, I think, in accepting this invitation <clears throat> in a Cavillian spirit, in the modest hope of suggesting its usefulness and interest for aesthetics and perhaps even for philosophical imagination in general. Sorry. So, in historical reconstruction of philosophy, it is not uncommon to trace, to track back to Plato, the setup of, of a field's agenda, or at least some of its conceptual origins. Aesthetics is no ex exception, representation, denizies, etc. Also, it is worth noticing that the ancients did not have, it seems, an all-encompassing term for art as a set of processes and objects. Uh, however, it is perhaps less common to recognize in Plato the emergence of a question which later in history came to be downplayed by tradition, at least in its polarized ramifications, beyond problems of judgment and representa representation, which I call the uses of art in life. Why so? First, this question was dissolved by modern ideas of autonomy. The extent to which this is a contemporary move of justification of art against unfavorable modern accusations of a lack of cognitive value remains to be seen. And second, this question was downplayed by setting up a doctrinal or instrumental, uh, sorry, 
plural, no? doctrinal instrumental tasks for arts to fulfill. Um, examples could, could range from the medieval moralities to the difficult, so-called difficult political parts of the 20th century, especially in the 60s, uh, and the more recent uses of art as aid helps to adaptive social technologies of happiness, perhaps rooted in, a unilateral, in, in unilateral regions of romantic eulogies of intuition. I'm certainly being unfair here to romantics. One wonders whether Plato would settle for either solution, having recognized the undisciplined power of art to affect persons Plato himself often uses mythos as a non-ironic tool to articulate his thought and engage poets at least as often as fellow philosophers in his dialectical exercises. No surprise there, art has powerful practical consequences in the development of the world of persons, even perhaps when it, when it is used in view of con contemplation, sublimation, etc. Through embodied meaning and continuous attention, art invites an attitude of reflexivity to and on life itself, this being the best way of accounting for its significance, I think. <clears throat> Apart from discussing the, the, the uses of difficult arts as parts and illustrations. So in an insightful essay called Plato Against Arts of 2010, Brazilian philosopher Fernando Muniz untangles from within the argumentative web of the Republic for the reasons why we should not settle for the picture of Plato well against arts. I, I won't go over this or have time to go into this. Let us keep this platonic invitation to take arts and its uses seriously. Plato's expulsion uh, of the poets notwithstanding. With that in mind, it is perhaps easier to recognize the common threat uh, that I want to point out in a number of 20th and 21st century voices that set out to investigate the uses of art in life as an open question and crucially a continuous task that is involving ongoing commitments of localized meaning giving. I say uses of art in life in terms of the ways in which art and literature articulates human engagement, fulfill a task of reflexive uh, orientation in life, which is open-ended, tentative, freed of bureaucratic protocols. Though still availing, availing itself of reasons for appreciation and, so, and for asserting value. That is why we can still talk of orientation. When Danto writes his Connections to the World in 1989, one of the crucial voices of contemporary aesthetics chooses to close the book in which he outlines his topical map of philosophy with a brief chapter entitled The Realm of the Spirits in a gesture not unlike that of the last paragraph of the Tractatus, where Wittgenstein despairs of glossing precisely those regions of thought and the experience he deems most important, connected to the domains of the ethical and aesthetic. And the aesthetic, in the last paragraph, Danto leaves his reader at the threshold of these very domains. <clears throat> I quote, of what Hegel fittingly called spirit in contrast to, to, to nature, the areas of politics, law, morality, religion, art, culture, and politics itself. Having brought the reader to this point, I must leave them, for the bulk of philosophical reflection has itself not crossed this boundary. And until it does, we are very much on our own. This side of the boundary, uh, Danto means the previous chapters of the book, is philosophically exports territory, the geography of which I have sought to describe. The realm of spirits is dark and difficult terra incognita, so far as philosophical understanding is concerned. Though it is as well, so far as human understanding is concerned, the most familiar territory of all. It is in the realm of spirits that we exist as human beings. End quote. 
it is difficult to draw a precise line marking out the crossing to practical philosophy unless expunged from the field of our objects all pragmatic aspects relative to the mundane existence of persons and communities and relative to the pragmatic contests where the use of linguistic signs emerge out of a gesturing towards, towards rules uh, or should I say paradigms paradigms between contingency and normativity. Wittgenstein has uh, uh, beautiful pages on this, on precisely this. The need for such a demarcation is, is of course, debatable. However, that may be, as Brazilian philosopher Arlene Moreno used to say when talking about the spirits of Wittgenstein's new methods, one of the same, one of the main sources of Cavell's philosophy of our new language, as you know, I quote, what can create secular misunderstandings is precisely to think that it is a question of instilling wishes, interests, personal tastes, all those things that we can sum up with the word, word will to instill these elements in the concept. On the contrary, it is a question of doing the inverse procedure, i.e., to instill concepts in the elements of the will to render it critical." End quote. The conditions for the experience of meaning can ultimately be traced back to a volitive style. But this fact neither invalidates the applicability of the notion of objectivity, nor is it a menace to philosophical rigor to instill concepts in the elements of the will should not be just a working program for the philosopher anxious to have professional impact in the monastic game of disputatio. For this is perhaps one of our deepest urgencies in the public sphere in days of triumph of a kind of irrationalism whose implications for the impossibility of minimal agreements we seem far from grasping and is crippling the conditions for deliberation. And I don't mean just politically, I mean in our lives in general, in our uh, ordinary conversations, I should say. We live in a time of strong recession of critical thinking and imagination in public conversation, at least that it is broadcasted to wider audiences in what is still oddly called the news. And aesthetics of repetition once again colonizes subjectivity by controlling recognition, narratives about experience, by unifying meaning-giving stories, which are then received as depictions of, the re uh, depictions of the world as it is, not possible versions of the world, either inner or outer. This loop is in the process of rekindling all number of dusty and human objectivities flags of Nazic political and aesthetic absolute allegiances. One wonders, by the way, whether this makes the late 20th century talk of grand narratives being passé a bit ironic in the 21st century. At the same time, our attention is dulled and dispersed by synthetic noise entertained by a sterile functional language and by a unilateral diet of cliched images looping in the sceneries of ordinary life. We become less dexterous in autonomous exercises of the spirit between efforts of caring for the self and malaises of resistance to reality. <clears throat> An increasing immersion in digital environments has not made things any easier. Our hyper-connectedness hyper co-occur with the appearance once again of scenes of public bigotry at the entrance of museums and art venues. In this context, it, it bears on the practices of the spirits to imagine new sensibilities, once again, beyond the experience of ever fleeting adaptation and its subtexts of fake meritocracy. And through them, new contexts of deliberation. I am thinking of the dense capacity of fictions to experiment with these. There is hope that in this new context of deliberation, fresh visions of communal ties might emerge in multiple planes of experience, existence, 
from love and desire to work, the experience of time and territory. Um, and greater experiment, uh, epistem epistemic justice be called for in and through the artificial framings of possible experience suggested by artwork. I'm using artificial positively, you understand, no? So yes, most days I remain prudently hopeful for what Richard Eldridge calls art's powers of orientation in life for us. These powers involve a number of aspects which, which are fairly open-ended. One of these aspects is the balance of conscious gesturing in this or that direction, acknowledgements, acknowledgements and, or avoidances, with an overall story that binds these gestures together or give them meaning in life. I mean, in our lives. Another aspect is balancing the presence of a story or Simone de Beauvoir's project with the ability to withstand in, in, in a bit of a frightened sense, to withstand the level of indetermination and surprise. The experience of persons in the life world is not a perfect projection of standing images or narratives that have anticipated it in the theater of the mind. A sense of improvisation is then called for, like steps in a dance. The immediately previous step somewhat determines the next. I'm using, I'm, I'm developing the metaphor of dance, no? Uh, as a suggestion within the overall formal composition of previous steps further back. And also given our physical bodies and their nat natural environments. But still, the next step will retain some character of novelty and unpredictability. This also means that sometimes the whole composition is subjected to a resetting of itself. Sometimes you forget what you're doing, isn't it, in dance and in life. When possible resolutions fade out and new stories or series of step, steps suggest themselves that were perhaps more removed from for, foreseeable horizons of meaning, that is, the suggestions of previous steps. So to talk here of attention and commitment, which are two important notions for Cavell in regard to artistic processes of production and reception, must not be construed as invitations to fixed visions of meaning or value, as invitations for dogmatism, self-righteousness, or stubbornness. The dance metaphor gives me a cue um, to go back to the notion of artistic processes as debureaucratization of or de automatization of perception. In the world view, Cavell points to an interesting contrast between painting and film and, and still photographs. Usually with paintings, uh, it does not make sense to ask for what is outside the composition of volumes within the frame, whereas with still photography and film, this speculation suggests itself naturally. In his book on filmmaker Werner Herzog, Richard Eldridge takes on the idea of cropping the indefinite film field of the actual existence, offering itself to the camera of a photographic film. A successful film is an occasion for a subjective absorption in the presentation of moving images viewed as the world. I quote, unfolding itself meaningfully on its own, apart from my temporary place in it, end quote. Eldry thinks that this is a similar phenomenon to what Mar Marcuse calls the affirmative dimension of art, quote, when in and through the very estrangement from ordinary experience, the artwork offer, offers the essence of reality in its appearance, end quote. Previously, he had specified a condition for any given film successfully supporting, quote, my conviction in this unfolding of the worlds. Noting that the cliched film, quote, will fail to do this. Why would a cliched film fail to present this unfolding of the worlds? A world, as he says, good enough for me to inhabit even its temporality, in temp temporarily. So this called my attention. Uh, 
In an essay called Art as Technique of 1917, Russian formalist critic Viktor Sklavsky challenges the proposition that art consists in thinking in images. To understand the function of imagery in literature, for example, one must distinguish, quote, imagery as a practical means of thinking, as a means of placing objects within categories, and imagery as a poetic, as a means of reinforcing an impression, end quote. Imagery, imagery as a practical means of thinking is one of the devices of the language of prose. Image as a means of reinforcing an impression is one of the devices of the language of poetry. Imagine, uh, Viktor Slavsky invites us to do, imagine as a, that a child is eating bread and butter and gets butter in her fingers. Now imagine that a child is playing with, with my glass and drops them. If I say, hey, butter fingers, you can see how the image works differently in these two contexts. Imagery in this second sense, where the child drops the my glasses, is an important device because the tendency of our habits of perception to become unconsciously automatic because of that. Quote, habituation devours work, works, clothes, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war. And art exists so that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists so to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived and not as they are known." End quote. There are several ways by which art disrupts recognition so that, so that we can see the objects again as if for the first time, thus engaging with an aspect of, outs of it outside of its knowledge alone. About this engagement, we can now say interesting things. We can now inhabit a plane of existence in which that object makes sense to us, or defies us, or intrigues us as to other similar objects and their significance, etc. Sklowski gives an example of, the, uh, of an odd description of flogging by Tolstoy, whose estrangement has the effect of pricking the conscious. He then goes on to generalize the technique of estrangement. Quote, I personally feel that defamiliarization is found almost everywhere. Form is found, end quote. Poetic speech, for example, is comprised of special arrangements of its material, phonetic and lexical structures, but also, quote, thought structures compounded from the world, end quote. Sorry, from the words. Aiming specifically, these devices, no? Aimed specifically as slowing or accelerating the act of reading. Sklovsky says that this is what generates satisfaction in poetic language. He means, I think, more than agreeableness of feeling. Estrangement denotes the undoing of, uh, of perceptual habits as anesthetics. One word, anesthetics to de-anesthetize our habit, uh, habits of perception. I feel I'm taking too long. How am I with time? Can I go on? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we had 38 uh, minutes, so you have, I don't know, 10 more minutes. OK. No OK. Great. Thanks. So. There is perhaps a direct line between this feature of artistic processes brought to their full fruition and the main topic of our seminar, or rather not direct the line, but one by way of Wittgenstein. Arguably, the two main pillars supporting the system of the philosophical investigations are the operative concepts of grammar and therapy. Assume that the philosophical work of clarification of images or of uses of concepts seeks to mark out differences and subtle but forceful intermediary connections between those uses. Assume also an intrinsic lack of perspicuity of grammar. So we orient ourselves in speech as if walking with a flashlight in the woods at night, not as 
triumphant trackers at the top of Mount Meaning with a clear view all around. Assume that the business of such a philosophy is not to correct that lack of perspicuity once and for all. Assume that philosophy so conceived starts when an interlocutor complains he no longer knows a way around concepts, propositions and presentations of beliefs. And that the business of philosophy is to set up di a dialogue through which hopefully a way back to ordinary experience of meaning is found or is to be found. Finally, assume that the whole endeavor serves no further philosophical project, for instance, the project of positing mother relations as foundational, necessary relations that would themselves be necessary. It is then as if, besides four resulting necessarily from the sum of two plus two, this very necessity should itself be necessary, expunging from the imagination a different kind of arithmetic pertaining perhaps to a different kind of uh, a different form of life, but the result would be five. A crucial technique Wittgenstein employs to, as he says, bring the world, bring the words from their metaphysical to their everyday use consists in, in inventing strange scenarios in order to force, so to speak, our vision to the limits of and possibilities of, of what is sayable given the language, or, or, or what I would say when, Cavell would say, given the language we use and given the creatures we are. He asked, for example, for the precise time when a given thought starts and stops in the mind and in the mind of its owner. What is that? Or he introduces off-earth creatures with doubts that would never occur to us about seemingly trivial uses uh, there's also, of course, the technique of calling attention to aspectuality. I'll talk a bit, a bit of, uh, about that, but I'm going to leave that outside. So the, bo the bottom line of this philosophical practice can appear to be nothing more than settling those moments of disorientation so our interlocutor can move on back to whatever practice had been placed in a sort of temporary suspension in order for philosophy to take place. Say, people taking a break in a biology lab to discuss a sudden referential opacity of the concept of life. <clears throat> but as I understand Arlene Moreno to have suggested in a book called Wittgenstein Through the Images, there is a deeper outcome to be expected in terms of a personal change of attitudes a renewed appreciation for, for the plurality of possibilities of the experience of meaning, and at the same time for our commitments, acknowledgements, avoidances to those possibilities that are closer to us. I wonder if this is a kind of Wittgenstein and Kavilian humanism. So, uh, some recent or not so recent voices uh, think it's convenient to once again speak of humanism, uh, which is a kind of an old fashioned word, um, to suggest a renewed attention to artistic processes through which ex precisely expansions of the imagination of the subjective autonomy are coupled with stabilizations of meaning. Um, I would like to connect this with a res uh, research of, uh, well, to say it very quickly, a fascist way of approaching experience and thought. Uh, probably a little bit outside also. Um, let me just say that uh, in many, uh, analysis of the uh, authoritarian personality, personality uh, especially in Europe in the 20s and 30s. Um, the linguistic aspect of this phenomenon was an important part of, of uh, these diagnostics. So uh, it is as if language has lost the ability to express what one wanted to say when. Yeah. 
uh, something like that. Um, and I could also talk of it, but I will leave that aside. Uh, some dangers of mentioning practical philosophy and humanism uh, as if it is a safe thing to do, just pointing out the field where a specific branch of philosophy gathers its objects. No? Uh, I mean, practical philosophy. Now they can both, practical philosophy and humanism, invite misunderstandings. Perhaps it's, it is worth saying something about this. Uh, there might be undesirable echoes of a conception of philosophy and of art as a technology of happiness or, or a doctrine of normalcy. Uh, Wittgenstein is a philosopher often accused, for example, of, uh, of being a conservative, which is a bit odd. Uh, these technologies of happiness, uh, this, this concept, no humanism and practical philosophy serving uh, as instruments by which subjectivity can be molded, sorry, these technologies of happiness and the doctrines of normalcy, no? serving as instruments by which subjectivity can be molded into new ideological webs with an allure of necessity. Uh, yet another version of human nature posing as a self-standing essence. No? This ideological move would then recall parochial aspects of modernity. So there's a bit of a problem also with the, the, the notion of modernity there linked to his justification of colonialism. Uh, and that would also be a source of misunderstanding, which I would like to point out. No? But practical philosophy, as we can take Cavell to have also practiced it, could reconnect with an ancient focus on the examination and realization of rational powers of, of the free human subject. I could take seriously the Wittgenstein in injunction about how the activity of philosophy should best be carried out as an examination, not of truth, though the concept does not lose it, uh, applicability, of course, it will be absurd, but of the experience of meaning. The philosophy as the analysis of truth alone in a sense, bears the mark of the platonic gesture of turning, turning dialogue into a massive reaction against our anxiety over a perceived lack of, of foundation for meaning. In contrast, ordinary language philosophy as the examination of the experience of meaning dislodges epistemology from its center, a move which involves the therapy of that anxiety. Uh, Richard Eldridge wrote a compelling essay about just this called From Epistemology to Aesthetics. I should note that the notion of meaning does not point here to effects of a structural field of relations of signs, but rather to associations of practices, to the between sign and term. These associations of practices are objective. So I'm saying objective non-ironically. <laughs> Uh, insofar as they are expressive of, or even constituted by, a recognizable human engagement. In a word, attitudes. One important regulatory concept of the philosophical work in aesthetics, as Cavell invited us to practice it, is, I think, the notion of spirits, as we saw above in the uh, uh, Danto quotes. It emerges in ancient philosophy already in connection to practices, to practical knowledge. So French philosopher Pierre Hadot recovers this practical dimension of spirits by rereading this, the history of Hellenistic and Roman philosophies in the key of mnemonic exercises in the life world, aiming at a discipline of body and mind, which he called exercice spirituel. In spite of the religious overtones in Hadot's reading, these exercises have no theological horizon, or at least not necessarily. Though I would not be interested in the, in the psychological and instrumental aspects of these exercises, 
Hadros Protects project as his story of ideas and is, is important to me to our middle way between those two theoretical excesses of radical autonomism and reductive instrumentalism, if you remember, because it recovers an image of philosophy <clears throat> not subsumed to the search for epistemic truth, to a discourse aiming at epistemic truth, which Hadot calls theory. He distinguishes theory from philosophy. It is somewhat ironic that the discussion of truth as it is broadcasted to wider audiences today misconstrues what is at stake in this criticism and end up canceling the applicability of this basic important notion in our ordinary life. I mean truth. Furthermore, spirit as operative concept can be taken as, as in itself a challenge to instrumentalism by rejecting the idea that meaning is essentially a function of specific practical purposes with a beginning and an end. If there are tasks involved in human expressive action, they are ongoing tasks. As we apply our inherited words and images to ever new contexts, if there are tasks, they are expressive tasks as we find ourselves compelled to gestures of acknowledgement and avoidance. There is also, and I'm beginning to end, a methodological motivation in following Cavell's invitation, as I've been trying to outline some of his features that stand out to me so far. It allows for a wide range of engagements with more specific, very lively discussions in contemporary philosophical aesthetics from the point of view of art's role as orientation and experiments in, in the life world, from the role of emotions and sensitivity to the question of articulation of thought in artistic and narrative media. We talked a bit about that with Andrea later today. Finally, the layouts and procedures of this Cavillian journey in aesthetics is meant not just as a philosophical contribution to the understanding of aesthetic processes, but also as a quest for a philosophical doing that positions itself favorably to lessons learned through experiment, uh, engagements with artworks and art forms. As I said earlier, echoing Cavell, if philosophy is once again to escape new forms of platonic control angst, it should allow for the articulation of voice in a gentler, non in positive fashion, without consuming itself entirely in agonistic theory building or error finding. Art taken seriously as part of the public use of reason has the potential to help training philosophers to better avoid two of their most pervasive professional hazards. So the notion that the conditions of, for a particular articulation are fundamentally to be shown through some form of philosophical reduction. Uh, for instance, the proposition that an apparent plurality is to make room for a single cause, form, category, ground, etc. And the accompanying notion that the appropriate methods to justify reductive moves like these is, is a specified mode of composition, perhaps akin of the scientific paper, thus driving a wedge between it and all the other modes of discourse, perhaps literary, essayistic, narrative, filmic, reopening the question of the uses of arts would invite us to reposition ourselves in relation to this wedge when we do philosophy. I think, which I take to be another of Cavell's invitations. So philosophy can once again be a vehicle of the human voice and be able to touch, hopefully touch wider audiences in these dark times of ours, not just convince. So that's it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Gilad.
thank you very much. Um, Sorry right? to talk too much. Yeah, I was. I enjoyed it. Um, sh shall we wait for a moderator, or shall I respond immediately? Oh, here we go. You you can already respond. The word okay. is yours. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Please go ahead. But thank you, Rafael. Thanks. So th thank you, Rafael, for the very rich paper. I um, found many of the connections you made provocative, and um, many of them I agreed with. Many of them I, I was surprised by, and I still need time to let them sink in. Um, so I'll, I'll read some of my reflections and questions following uh, reading your paper. And I have to apologize for not addressing many of the points that you make, particularly, and that's my fault, my nature, that I just leave most of the political implications aside. But I found that connection in particular fascinating, and I hope we, during discussion, we can address those as well. So I'll start by um, describing the central question you raise in your paper, namely, what would it take for art to escape reification. I think you mean, in Cavellian terms, what would it take for art to be a means to um, respond to skepticism? How could it achieve that? And this question leads you to reflect on the very nature of artistic endeavor. And one central inflection of your investigation is, what is the use of art? And um, one question one could immediately raise is whether we can make sense of the artistic practice at all without finding a use for it. Whether this question, what is the use for art, is so fundamental for our understanding of art that we um, cannot understand art in any other way. Um, and if we do find a use for art, say a theoretical or a practical use, the question you raise is would we not thereby efface the distinction between art and theory or art and practice, would we not thereby make art superfluous, useless? Um, so you suggested we would begin to see how art could be useful by seeing how it could be a means of responding to skepticism. And we could do that only if we stop assuming that any account of the usefulness of art is subject to the following dilemma, a dilemma that I think you take to be a false dilemma. Art is either in the service of some ulterior purpose, you call this reductive instrumentalism, and if so, if it's merely a means to an end, and that end could plausibly be achieved by other means, then art would become superfluous, useless. This is one horn of the dilemma, and the other horn is art is not useful at all, but, um, or anyway, it's not useful for anything but for art. This is what you call radical autonomism, art for art's sake, aesthetic autonomy, where there's no purpose art serves outside itself. Your paper proposes that seeing art as a response to skepticism is providing an alternative to this dilemma. The mission of art would then be bringing into consciousness of that which is, for the most part, invisible and unconscious, um, specifically, or, or just taken for granted. Um, you mentioned what Wittgenstein calls praxis or um, forms of life, um, or our existential engagement with the world as the kinds of things that art brings into consciousness. One question or worry one might have here is how to distinguish this proposal, if I've accurately described your proposal, from being yet another reductively instrumentalist account of the use of art, another version of the idea that art serves some theoretical goal. Well, as Cavell shows us, the question of skepticism is not entirely or not at its core a theoretical question, or um, this is maybe the beginning of the answer to my worry. My worry was perhaps based in a confusion. So 
And the answer to skepticism is not, um, let's say, um, a theoretical claim. You can't answer the skeptic by uh, in that way. What you strive to do is to dissolve the skeptical question. And if this is so, then arts, uh, you know, if art issues reminders of praxis of forms of life of that which we already know, um, this should not count as art conveying some kind of knowledge that we lack, but it should count as altering our relation to what we know. Um, maybe to further articulate the setup of your argument, um, allow me to question your view, your reading of Plato's conception of art, and I invite you to defend your view, but it will help me uh, articulate the dilemma and also the solution or the alternative to it. So you're right to say that Plato recognized that art has a unique power, but it seems to me that um, he did not really propose an alternative to the dilemma between reductive instrumentalism and radical autonomism, but that his account of art ultimately collapses into one of these extremes. Um, so you imply around page seven that uh, for Plato, art invites reflection in and of life, but I fail to see this um, in Plato. Um, and um, I'll return to Plato in a second. You also suggest that art has the role of imagining new sensibilities, practical possibilities, etc. And here I raise again a worry that I raised before, um, that it's not clear why it should fall to art to discharge this kind of epistemic tasks. I mean, things that might all also be uh, achieved by other um, kinds of um, enterprises. Now, you suggest following Arlie Moreno that art's goal is not to instill will in the concepts. Well, actually, Arlie Moreno, I guess, there is talking about philosophy, but I take you to uh, apply this out, um, to art as well, that the goal is not to instill will in the concepts and norms that we have, but to instill concepts in our will. And I found this passage uh, evocative and thought provoking, but again, I'm worried that even these formulations may be read in a way that's reducible to the reductive instrumentalist view. So I'm challenging you to distinguish the usefulness of art from the um, kinds of uses that could be reduced, um, could, be, could um, yeah could be achieved um, independently of art. So staying for a moment with what Moreno rejects, he rejects um, the use of art to instill concepts in our wills. Um, isn't this precisely what Plato also saw art as doing and why he rejected it? So he saw art, that's where I'm um, challenging your reading of Plato uh, or challenging you to add something here. He saw art as a form of bewitchment, a power that um, engages people's base drives, dupes them into taking the false to be true, et cetera. It's a form of brainwashing, ideology. So everything that belongs to what I understood as the reductive instrumentalist understanding of art. Um, so this is not to say anything about how Plato understands beauty and aesthetic experience. There is other things he says about that. It's just in relation to art as, as the, that kind of um, human practice. Um, also, maybe one should in Plato distinguish between music and dance and the mimetic arts. So um, we could also link that. Aside. Anyway. Um, Let me uh, move on 
your articulation of the alternative to the dilemma reaches the most clear formulation, I think, at the point where you discuss art um, in connection with those ideas of philosophy as spiritual exercise. So if art and reflection on art can similarly be a means for self-transformation, then this would be a use which is, doesn't seem to be reducible to any theoretical content or practical um, work. And it would not be a use which could be achieved in other means or not easily achieved in other means. There could be a unique way of, of, in which art um, achieves this goal. Um, and so um, I'd like to discuss a few further evocative characterizations you give to this kind of alternative to, to the um, transform, what I would call the transformative use of art. Um, particularly what you call the de-automatization of perception. Um, I mean, maybe you mean it literally, but I think it could also um, be said metaphorically that art um, opens us up or doesn't just um, alter our perception, but it opens us up to a re-evaluation and transmutation of our norms um, here again, art is not taken to serve some, to convey theory or to dictate norms or to motivate, um, but rather to affect our relation to the normative structures that we are immersed in. And you mentioned in this connection also Beauvoir's um, rejection of inhuman objectivities and Cavell's struggle against avoidance. So. These are two forms of reaction to an inauthentic immersion in our everyday skepticism and from which perhaps by means of art we can um, release ourselves. And you also connect this, um, and I found that very interesting, to Wittgenstein's method of perspicuous representation. Um, I mean, the therapeutic methods of Wittgenstein um, also aim to transform the practitioner or the interlocutor. Um, in the case of the perspicuous representation, um, one seeks by rearrangements of things that one already knows to change the way one sees those things. So one doesn't provide new knowledge, one could say. It's not that um, doing that um, could also be done um, sorry, so anyway, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just go on with describing what you say and not <laughs> um, sort of read into it too much of what I think about it. You also compare, so you also give another model for this kind of work. You compare it to the power of metaphors or images to change our perception of a situation to alter or disrupt our habits of applying concepts in certain fixed ways, thereby allowing us to see the world anew or differently. Um, finally, um, you invoke in this context the Cavellian idea of the truth of skepticism, and you don't fully make clear what you mean there. So I'm just going to say a few things and I invite you to, to clarify how that sort of um, works. Um, um, so I'm not sure whether when you talk about it, you think of skepticism um, theoretical, in the theoretical register, whether you're talking, whether you're taking art to be concerned um, with that uh, which we cannot know, but believe we must know as skeptics, and hence despair of knowing, namely um, the totality of the world or the self-concealing source of our feeling at home in the world. And I wanted to mention that the thought that art can bring us into an oblique touch with that, that it can manifest that kind of um, um, 
well, that it can manifest being is Heidegger's um, fundamental thought in his origin of the artwork essay. And it uh, might be interesting to, to look in that direction. Um, but maybe when you say here, when you evoke here the truth of skepticism, you think more of a practical um, um, inflection of skepticism. Um, maybe you want to say that art addresses our separateness, our solitude, or transform our understandings of ourselves and of each other. Um, in any case, I would like to hear more about how exactly you want to spell out um, this idea, the idea that art um, affects the deautomatization of perception and that art can serve the role um, served by philosophy when it is understood as a spiritual exercise or as therapy. Um, in short, how art can transform us. It would be really great if you could develop any specific examples that you have in mind, um, such as, you know, perhaps not right now, but maybe you could give us an idea of what kind of artworks you have in mind as ex exemplary in these respects, as performing this role. And thanks again for the wonderful paper. So thank you so much, Gilad, for your uh, detailed and very, very useful reading. I, I, I do have much work. Uh, I have with this with this with this uh, text. Sure, <clears throat> uh, this I, I should point out uh, that this is a really a, 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 a work in progress. So this is not a result of of, of research already uh, heavy research already done. Uh, and uh, I tried perhaps uh, this was a, really a problem. I tried to pack. Too much things that I uh, that I only brushed uh, superficially or, or or alluded to without uh, further analyzing, giving giving detailed examples, etc. Especially perhaps in relation to Plato. So uh, I agree uh, absolutely with, with uh, everything you said about Plato. <clears throat> and uh, uh, but to me uh, to to. To bring back Plato at the onset of such a research is a, is really a, a sort of a gesture, uh, a strategic gesture, to 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 mark out this reading I want to I want to make uh, of, of contemporary aestheticians, uh, but it has nothing to do with any of Plato's conclusions <laughs> around the role of arts, etc. Uh, it, it, it simply has to do with, and perhaps it's, it's a bit of a, a, a provocation of mine, it has to do with the intuition uh, Plato had at the beginning of his uh, reflections, which then led him to perhaps uh, some bad conclusions <laughs> and extreme measures <laughs> in relation to uh, a healthy ideal republic. No? In what regards uh, art's role in it, so uh, so that, uh, the 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 reason of, of of bringing Plato to this conversation is not uh, because of his conclusions, but because of his uh, basic uh, intuitions uh, of 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 the uh, of the imparts of the importance of the of the power of life uh, of of art. Uh, to the, or, or, or that it can have or has in our lives. Yep. Uh, I guess I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer you uh, everything you said in detail, but I guess much of what you said has to do with uh, the sense in which I want to say that there are in contemporary philosophical imagination uh, an image of arts that 
tries at least to escape that dichotomy I outlined, yeah, that that polarization uh, I outlined. And uh, if if there is such a, an image of art, uh, how it is how is it not another instance of one of the poles, especially the instrumentalist pole? No. And I guess to start to address, to, to, to devise an answer to that, uh, it is useful to discuss uh, the very sense in which uh, of our, the sense uh, I find in uh, discussing uh, practical uses of art in life. Uh, and it's, I, I find it very difficult at this point to make detailed distinctions, to make uh, adequate marks of uh, frontiers uh, in the uses of arts in life. Uh, so that I wouldn't be uh, accused of rekindling one of those uh, poles again. That has to do precisely with, I, I suppose, the fact that I want to talk about art as an exercise, uh, a spiritual exercise of persons in life, yeah? Uh, and I want to leave room to many aspects which are very dangerous to, re to leave room to. For, ex for instance, the idea that art uh, serves as a source of knowledge uh, or constitutes a, a, a plane of experience which, in which we can also gather uh, knowledge about aspects of our, uh, of our lives. Um, so, because I want to do that, it is difficult to say that art serves no purpose. Um, if I, I, I do not want to uh, include in those purposes uh, things like self uh, 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 self knowledge, things like knowledge about the the uh, conditions of uh, our uh, subjective experience, and etc. So I, I want to seek for images of art in contemporary aestheticians, which reserve, which do not fall into either of those poles without at the same time denying art practical purpose. On the contrary, uh, but that practical purp purpose is neither uh, self-absorbed in artistic processes, nor is it a function of something else with which art has no sort of solution of continuity. If I say art serves as, as a purpose of, of, of self-knowledge, uh, it is also because there is no uh, fast uh, uh, wall between an exercise in self-knowledge and whatever we do when we engage with arts. Something like that. Uh, one thing I, sh I, 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 can, I should point out is that I'm not suggesting that arts must uh, that it must not fall to arts to fulfill 
a specific cognitive role. If I suggest something like that, uh, then it's a problem of my wording. I do not believe that arts, uh, that, it, that it imparts on arts to fulfill any specific function, uh, which wouldn't be able, which any other uh, form of articulation of the spirits could, uh, uh, could serve, you see? Philosophy, for instance, perhaps, is the closer to arts, I, I think. Uh, um, also, in connection to this, I should point out that I am not in search of a discourse which uh, tries to present itself as some sort of justification for arts. You see? I'm really, uh, this is really um, a, a montage of, 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 of an operation of reading, as Cavell often does. Uh, he, he, he does philosophy by reading people, by talking to people. Uh, um, this is not an attempt or a beginning of an attempt of a theory of arts. Uh, but also, uh, neither is it a beginning of an attempt of, of, of a discourse that will try to justify arts in, in, in whatever way. So, um, you, you also mentioned um, uh, the theme of de-automatization, de, -automatization, de of perception. Um, so in answer to that, uh, the, the, your second hypothesis is, is the good one. So I'm, I'm not interested in, in the theoretical side of skepticism. I'm interested in its practical side and <clears throat> in arts, uh, pretty much in Cavillian terms, uh, can be uh, an exercise in practical uh, skepticism. So, uh, so that's it. Uh, I'm afraid I have not been uh, of much, I have not answered uh, in detail your, your excellent reading and questions, but, well. That's fine, we, we can continue this um, um, later. Um, I'd love to. But, um, Jonathan, did, did you want to jump in and We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Let me just ask once again for our audience if we have any other questions. Otherwise, you could. We have still some minutes if you want to, to continue the discussion. I, I would perhaps just like to invite Rafael to, because I was very interested in, in the last question that Gillard raised about the truth in skepticism, what, what you mean by that and what is the connection with the, with art perhaps. It, it, that's kind of the general question, but, but I'm very, would, would like to hear more about that if possible. So, uh, remember that's not the, 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 the bulk of my proposition and, and really uh, I'm, that's something I have I haven't worked out uh, uh, clearly uh, to myself, I'm afraid. Uh, but I guess I can say uh, that I, as I understand it, uh, this, uh, the truth of skepticism, uh, if it is useful to this image I take or, or, or I, 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 I use Cavell to, to uh, suggest uh, as an, an image of, of our use of arts, is uh, not, is, 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 a, is, a, is an invitation to uh, a, a type of engagement with, uh, or a type of, of, of uh, openness, uh, reflection, 
uh, an open attitude towards uh, our acknowledgments and avoidances. So, so the truth of uh, skepticism would be uh, like the mark of a scene for the, uh, a particular experience of meaning, which would take place in, through, uh, from our engagement with art forms. Uh, perhaps as well as philosophy. So I'm, this, um, so I, I take this as uh, another <clears throat> way of answering to, to Gilead when we asks when he asks he asks if I take skepticism in a more theoretical uh, uh, fashion or or, or 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 in a more practical aspect of it. Thank you. Uh, Richard has a comment, and then Arata also would have a question if we have time. I think we have. I will put all, you all on screen and then just be great. Uh, good. Thank you, Raphael. Um, it should be of some interest to everyone to know that Raphael and I have been talking about these issues for some years now, uh, and I owe my own acquaintance with Pierre Hadot, whom I will talk about a bit today, uh, to Raphael. Uh, I enjoyed this paper enormously. I think I have no objections to it at all. Uh, the suggestion, the comment I wanted to enter is you mentioned Raphael um, Marcuse on aesthetic affirmation at one point as a matter of bringing reality into appearance. Uh, that's certainly correct that Marcuse says that. One thing we might add is that the reality he has in mind that's brought into appearance, into the actual world by way of what he calls the tyranny of form in the artwork is human reality, in particular human beings as species beings, capable of creative uh, life and cooperation with others rather than instrumentalized and brutally competitive life. Um, so the work of art manifests the exercise of creative powers and challenges thereby depersonalization, bureaucratization, and social routinization. So I think the idea that it's human species being or human creative rational powers that are in view is useful in this context. What this has to do with the truth of skepticism might be the further thought that that work is never done. Uh, there's no full liberation of subjectivity into unfreighted, uncontestable meaningfulness ever. Right? So that's just a line of comment, I think, playing out the the full dimensions of Marcuse's thought and then connecting that with Cabell could be kind of useful. Sure, thanks so much, Richard. Uh, yeah, Marcuse, uh, is, uh, you, you seduced me to to put Marcuse in my list of, of stops in this journey ahead, and I certainly would do that. And also, it is important that you remember this, this idea of the truth of the scene of, of the truth of skepticism being uh, the scene of something which is uh, uh, another another instance of the this idea of ongoing tasks of our human experience, isn't? It? Yeah. Thanks so much, Richard. So, Arata, please. So, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Rafael, if, if I may. Um, um, we haven't met, but I'm sure. happy to meet sure. you. Uh, uh, so yeah, thank thank you for that really um, talk. I, um, I I guess my question sort of builds on on both Richards and Genesis um, interventions um, regarding the truth of skepticism. Um, so um, one. One figure it, it seems like might be relevant here is uh, Michael Fried, and like Michael Fried's notion of theatricality, um, uh, and the idea of theatricality, of course, you know, um, comes up in, in the world view, um, and the like the basic sort of Friedian idea, um, that at least with certain arts, um, not theater, actually, but. Um, uh, but uh, photography, um, uh, painting, um, I think uh, movies are, are perhaps an exception, but um, uh, there's, there's like 
the issue of theatricality is sort of built into the medium, right? And, um, and it seems like that can be viewed as, um, so to speak, skepticism in the arts that, that is where, where like theatricality seems to be, um, I mean, it seems like there are different ways in which it can be characterized, but um, uh, I mean, it seems like it's connected to perhaps to what the term reification, but um, it's something like um, uh, um, the reduction of um, that which is being conveyed into into the image, you know, the capture in it, into an image, you know, and for the spectator, which is somehow like essentially related to the spectator. Um, and so like one of the problems of art is to like overcome this, um, this the you know, theatricality. And like, I've always heard that as, um, as the skeptical problem inside art, you know, so to speak. Um, and um, it, so it seemed like it's it, like, trying to sort of um, you know, understand how art is a response to skepticism. Um, it might be uh, worth considering you know, the possibility that whether well, there is a thread of skepticism that's built into the art medium and that it has to, like art is faced you know, with the problem of skepticism, which is internal to it, rather than something, you know, skepticism being something outside of it to which art would then be a response. Um, so I, I, this isn't exactly coming to a question, but it just, you know, th does that seem like a, um, a reasonable way of like, you know, taking your thoughts? Because I, I, I think this is, I mean, I take this to be just um, a further development, you know, of, of the paper. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, this concept of theatricality, I, I, I heard of it uh, by, uh, from Andrea Cassell uh, later in this morning, and I and I was very interested in it. So that's something I'll be looking into uh, soon. Uh, but it certainly brings uh, 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 conjoins with the, this idea of art as another setting for for for. Or skepticism to exert itself uh, outside of, of that uh, epistemic or exclusively ex epistemic uh, aspect of it into uh, this uh, exercise of, of, of an ongoing task of inhabiting the human. Sure. And thank you for pointing that out. So I'll be looking into this uh, concept of theatricality in Michael Fried. Sure. Thanks so much. Well, I think we are almost, well, we, we are actually uh, yeah. running out of time and we have another uh, conference soon, another talk with Professor Fischer. Yes. So I, do, I would like to thank everybody for your participation in this, in this talk and thank you, Rafael and Gilad, especially. If you have any last words, please go ahead. No, I'd just like to thank you very much for the uh, for your comments, for your sensible comments, and, and your very useful comments, and for hearing me. And Jonathan and Andrea for having me. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye, everybody. See you soon. See you all soon.